HRC, 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 Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, church. Of the Talon family. We hope everybody's doing well today. We welcome you to Hebrew Readers Church. We have a great lesson lined up for everyone today. The lesson is Flee from Partiality. All right, so we're going to be touching on a number of different topics within partiality and really gaining an understanding of how this can play in a church or in someone's life and also the spirits behind it. As you know, we like to touch on the spiritual things and also how to come out of partiality, how to change the perspective and the mindset to truly be in one with Allah. All right. Um, as you know, I'm your brother Zakwa. I have Brother Kasafo here with me today as well. Be with you. All right. So let's get started. Um, as always, please visit the website at www.hebrewreaders.com. And if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the chat below or you can send us an email. All right, let's get started with flee from partiality. We cannot be partial in anything, whether to Allah, our brothers and sisters, and or our enemies. The way we operate in the physical is a reflection of how we operate in the spiritual. So the bad habits and struggles we have towards our brothers and sisters is the same way we'll operate towards Allah in our walk. Let's dive into it. We have to be walking in true love without partiality. Let's first get the definition of partial and then we'll get the definition of partiality so that we can all have an understanding going forward. Partial is favoring one side in a dispute above the other, biased. Impartiality is unfair bias in favor of one thing or person compared with another, favoritism. Right. So you can see how being a respect of a person goes into partiality. You can see how sedition or division or schism goes into partiality, you also can understand a perspective and going against the law can actually go into partiality as well. So we get to see how all things in the spiritual can play into the physical and all things from the physical can play into the spiritual. So we get to truly see that partiality or being partial and how it can affect our walk or our relationship with Allah, seeing that we can be biased, we can be unfairly biased toward Allah when it comes to his law or when it comes to the fruits of the spirit. If it doesn't meet what we desire, we can be in favor of ourselves or we can be in favor of the devil. So you really get to see and get, and we're going to understand how that partiality looks and how it actually has effect of us in all our actions. So whether that one side is your own perspective or the perspective of one you favor, we have to keep our hearts in line with Allah perspective and not our own. For that would bring us in unity with one another, especially in the body, and keep us from division whether towards our brothers and sisters or towards Allah. Can we jump into Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, and then we'll get the definition so that we can continue to build and gain understanding. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, 
hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. All right, so we're going to touch on seditions right now. Okay, um, the definition for seditions is G1370. If you don't mind reading that for me, Casa, please. Sure. The definition is disunion. That is figuratively dissension, division, sedition. Right. So we get to see that disunion, where union is everyone's in harmony and concord with one another. It's unity. But this is disunion. So everyone's not in unity, being of the same mind with one another. Right. So we end up, it ends up being division because people aren't in agreement. And that's one thing that we don't want to fall into, especially in a church that everyone has their own doctrine. Everyone has their own mindset. Everyone has their own perspective. When our perspective is supposed to be in line with Elohim, because we have those three that bear record in heaven. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they're in agreement with one another. They're not in disunion, or they're not divided one against another. So if we're going to be in Elohim, how can we be divided from Elohim, not in agreement with the law and the fruits of the spirit that they bring forth and that they're in agreement with? So that's one thing to examine for ourselves when it comes to being spiritual or when it comes to um, growing in our faith, that we are actually examining ourselves and reasoning with ourselves to see if we're actually in agreement with the law in all things. This is one of the works of the flesh, seditions. So let's understand how this spirit can come into us and how it operates, right? So though all the things that we just read in Galatians 5, those are works of the flesh, which that means that those are the laws of the devil. That's the laws that he operates in, or we operate in if his spirit enters into us and then operates in us or through us. Let's jump over to John chapter 10. We're going to start at verse 7, and we're going to go down to 13, please. All right. John chapter 10, verse 7. Then said Yahweh unto them, again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Right, so we get to see that Yache is giving us understanding to help our perspective of his intent. Okay, so by Yache giving us that understanding, he's hoping that we will be in agreement, agreement with him and to trust him. So let's understand what the perspective is because he's explaining that he's not the thief. He's the one that's coming to give life more abundantly. But there's others that are thieves. So let's understand the perspective of his intent and the perspective of the intent of others that are coming so that we can actually examine to see if we're in agreement with him to actually do what he's asking us to do. Um, let's continue in John chapter 10, verse 11, please. Okay, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. Right. So we see that these are the false prophets that are leading us away from the perspective of our Savior. Because Yahweh said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And we're going to touch on that later by precept to understand what he's actually saying. Can we continue in John chapter 10, verse 13, please? Sure. Verse 13. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. 
Right. So anyone leading you away from the law or the commandments or the fruits of the spirit does not care for you because life is in the law. So they're leading you away from life by leading you away from the law. Let's um, read Proverbs chapter 13, verse 14, so that we can understand that. Proverbs 13 and 14. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Right. So the law of the wise, which Elohim is the wise, is, is the, is the wisest, it's the fountain of life. And it actually departs or it makes us leave off from the snares of death. So we actually have life through the law. All right. So let's keep that in mind. Um, let's jump back over to John chapter 10, verse 14, please. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. All right. So if we are his sheep. We should gain to see his perspective. Right, so we want to to see his perspective, and we should know him through the perspective that he's giving us, and the law and the fruits of the spirit. So, if we're walking in the law and we're walking in the fruits of the spirit, we will grow closer to Elohim because we're becoming one with them. So that's how we actually grow in the spirit or grow out of partiality. It's by not walking in favoritism or unfair biasness in our own perspective, or our own regard, but actually changing our perspective that we may actually walk in the same perspective as Elohim, seeing that they are in agreement with one another. And they're calling us to be a part of their family so that we may be in agreement with them as well. Let's continue with John chapter 10, verse 15 through 21, please. Sure. John 10 and 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. So we get to see again. They're in agreement. As the Father knoweth Yache, even so Yache knows the Father. They're in agreement. They have one perspective not multiple perspectives that actually cause the division. And we're going to understand a little bit later how it actually causes the division to have examples in the scriptures of how it happens and why it happens. Um, continue, Katha, please. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. So we see the son and the father have the same perspective and are not divided. They have the same goal because they agree with one another. So it brings more power. It brings more power because Yache said, I lay down my life of myself. Though the father gave me commandment to do it, I was in agreement to do it. And that's what made it more powerful. And that's what made them the work of his hands be prosperous because they were actually walking in agreement. So we have to walk in that same agreement with Elohim, omitting our own egos, our own lust, our own desires, and cleaving and, and changing our perspective to be that of the law of Elohim, and not deviating from the law or trying to make alterations to the law so that we can fulfill our lust in the law, but seeing it for what it is and actually accepting it and being content with it so that we will not be veered off or led astray through our own lust, but that we will actually subdue our own lust within our flesh and we can cast it out 
we're going to get into this when we get into reasoning so that we can actually truly understand how to abolish um, our lust within us it actually causes us to go astray or causes us to not be in one unity with the perspective of Allah Hayim. but we're going to get there. Um, let's continue um, going into John chapter 10, verse 19, please. Verse 19. There was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. Right. So now we get to see the division and how it's coming. Yache said what he said, that he layeth down his life for the sheep. Right. And those sheep know him. Right. Just as he knows the father and the father knows him. He said his sheep know him. Right. Do if the father love me because he laid down his life that he might take it again. And no man taketh it from him because he laid it down on his own accord. So now when Yache saying all these things, now the Jews are starting to be divided from one another in their perspectives. All right. Let's understand the different perspectives that they had. Go ahead, Brother Costa, please. And many of them said, he hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? So you see, the way that they're perceiving things actually caused the division. So why are some perceiving things one way and others perceiving things another? Right, and this, we're going to get down to it. We're going to continue to go forward and we're going to understand our perception of things and where it comes from, All right? So the only way there can be partialities or division or sedition is that we don't agree with one another. We have to be willing to lay down our life for one another. All those in the body of Yahshua Christ, not just those that we're close to or we're close with or we like personally, for even Yache laid down his life for his sheep, which are our brothers and sisters. And he laid down his life for some that he didn't even know. It's physically, of course, he's Alahayim. He knows everyone. Yeah. But, you know, understand, just for the understanding's sake. Seeing that we are the body of Christ, and for our own understanding, seeing that there's people that we don't know in the body of Yache that we have to be willing to lay down our life for them too. All right? So let's understand that. Let's understand laying down our life. Uh, can we jump over to John 15 and 13, please? Sure. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. All right. So this is the greatest love a man can give, being truly selfless. This is the pinnacle of love, is that a man lay down his life for his friends. Greater love hath no man than this. This is the greatest love, right? And that is being a sacrifice or being truly selfless. Because love, true love is selfless. Selfishness falls into hatred. So we have to be very aware and on guard when selfishness actually tries to enter into us or does enter into us to know that that is not the right spirit because Yache didn't operate in selfishness. If we're going to be in agreement with Elohim and we're going to, to cleave unto his law and look from his perspective, we also have to examine and reason in ourselves to see that we're doing things that are contrary to how Elohim would actually do it or operate or see it. So we have to change that for us to be able to serve Elohim. Because if not, we will fall into the same understanding as some of the men in John chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, and say that he hath a devil and he is mad. Why hear ye him? And that's the perspective or the way that they received what he said and what was going on. So you see how powerful 
the way we receive things is because it can actually lead us astray from Elohim. So you can see how important this conversation is and how important this teaching is to actually allow us to um, process and to, and to see things from a right scope, not from our own scope or the scope of another spirit, but from the spirit of Elohim so that we can actually be in accord and be, and we can come and be in unity with one another in the body of Yajay. So even Paul had to address divisions in the church. And we see now it comes from not being in agreement with one another. So let's understand what Paul was actually speaking of, seeing that there were divisions in the churches during his time. Uh, let's jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 and 18, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So we know that Yache is not divided, nor is Elohim divided with one another being three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as we spoke of before. But Paul says something very key. He said, now in this I declare unto you, and I praise you not. So I don't I don't have any joy in this. That ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. So let's not come and be one body when everything is going good and we're coming and we're rejoicing and we're fellowshipping and it's just great and everybody's having good vibes and we're just enjoying one another. Let that not be the only time that we come together in unity or we come together in um, in harmony, but also for the worst. So when things is tough or when something's going on, let us also come together too. Let us not be divided because something is going on that's hard to deal with. So we can't be partial, only wanting to be around when things are doing well or things are great but we also have to be together and stand for one another and be in agreement with one another when things are hard too or when there's a difficult situation, all right? Let's jump over to Ephesians chapter four. We're gonna read verse one through six um, so that we can understand what Yache is actually calling us to do and in the understanding of what Elohim desires for us go ahead Katha, please ephesians 4 and 1 i therefore the prisoner of the lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace right he said he beseeches us that we walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. So he's actually asking us, hey, you actually have to do these things and be in agreement with these things so that you will be walking worthy of the vocation of the calling that Elohim has called upon you. We have to be in agreement to walk in lowliness of mind and meekness. We have to be in agreement to walk in long suffering. We have to be in agreement to walk forbearing one another in love. All right, that means that we have to correct one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity, we have to strive for that. Though it may be hard sometimes, we have to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now, the unity of the spirit what is the unity of the spirit? Because we're, we're, this is right on what we're talking about today. Just like Elohim is not divided, we have to walk and not be divided with one another, nor Elohim. So we have to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. We have to strive for that and not being sidetracked 
by anything to cause us to go astray from that unity, from that, from that focus, from that desire. Continue, Brother Costa, so that we can actually understand that what is the calling for us or the vocation with which we are called. Go ahead, Brother Costa, please. Verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Allah and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So you can actually see that we're supposed to be in agreement in everything. There's one body, one spirit of Allah There's one body of the church. Right? There's one dono, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So how can we then be divided in everyone is preaching the gospel when our gospels are different. How can everyone be walking in faith when everyone's faith is different? Because there's only one Allah and Father of all. So we can't have different perspectives. We can't have different doctrines. And that's something that tells us that, hey, we need to examine what's going on here because something is leading us astray. Something is leading us astray from being in unity to actually agree with one doctrine because there's only one right way. There's not multiple right ways. The law is the right way. The fruits of the spirit is the right way. And it's just that simple. If we go trying to find another way, we become a thief and a robber. So we truly have to examine ourselves and actually reason with ourselves as to what is actually causing us, if this be the case, to actually have another perspective from the perspective of Allah The only way we can have seditions and partiality is if we're walking in different spirits from one another. Let's touch on James chapter 3, verse 14, and then we'll continue from there. James chapter 3, verse 14. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Okay, so we get to see if the spirit of bitterness or envy or strife is operating in our hearts, let us not glory in something that we're doing wrong. Because what's going to happen if we glory and doing something wrong or we get lifted up in ourselves not wanting to humble ourselves or see things for what they are or if the law departs from our hearts or our minds and we lift ourselves up in our iniquity we're going to lie against the truth because what we're doing is wrong so we can't blind ourselves or, or turn a blind eye from what's right at any point. And this goes for everyone. So we're not supposed to glory in those things, seeing that those things are going to cause us to lie against the truth. Because the truth of the matter is, is that that's not what Allah would do. And that's not Allah perspective nor desire. So if those things are entering into our hearts, there's no glory in it. That wisdom of us lifting ourselves up in our iniquity and not wanting to humble ourselves to say that we're wrong and to actually come out of it, it's not from above. It's not the spirit of Allah that's leading us 
and that's prospering us to do these things. But it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. So we actually get to understand that we're actually cleaving unto another law, which is the works of the flesh. So we actually have to be very mindful not to give ourselves over to another law or another spirit that's going to cause us to deviate or to go away or to stray from the law of Elohim, seeing that the law of Elohim is right and it's good and his perspective is right. The way that he views life is right. The way that he um, goes about and walks is life and true and righteous and it comes from him. So we actually have to conform to him. And that's when rebellion actually comes into play, where many of us, we are very rebellious in our life, but we think that we can just flip the switch when it comes to Allah and serving him, when it's very much the contrary, because that's what we're used to. That's our perspective. That's our outlook. So when our outlook is rebellion, and that's something that we do habitually, and it happens innately, we're going to operate in that and not even realize that we're being rebellious. Because our perspective is in the spirit of rebellion. So we're not going to see it. Because that's what's right in our sight. So we're not going to be able to see the perspective of Allah because we're going to be partial. So these are things that we have to be very, very mindful of and very, very vigilant of to actually examine ourselves and reason with ourselves after we have examined ourselves to understand what we're doing, to reason with ourselves according to the law and according to the wisdom of Allah to actually correct our perspective, right? And these spirits, these same spirits that we're talking about in James chapter 3, these same spirits come into the church by reason of Allah for us to examine ourselves and to be on guard for, right? So these same spirits that we're talking about, they come into the church, and the reason is, we're going to see. Uh, can we read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, please? Sure. 1 Corinthians 11 and 19. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. All right. So now we're getting understanding or insight as to why these things happen. So even in Galatians chapter 5, we got to see that it says seditions, and then it went into heresies. Heresies was the next one, All right? So let's understand what heresies is so that we can actually understand what we're talking about. Um, can we read the definition G139, please? It's uh, properly a choice. All right. So properly a choice. It's interesting because we actually choose our perspective. Just like when we were reading um, about those, when when Yahche was speaking in John, they chose the perspective that they wanted to see. Some said he had the devil, he's mad. That was the perspective that they chose. That's what they wanted to see. And some said, can a devil heal the sick? That was the perspective that they wanted to see. That was a choice. So we actually get to see that heresies is a choice. Go ahead, Brother Kasavo. That is specifically a party or abstractly disunion. Right. So it's not in unity. Heresies doesn't bring unity. And heresies forms a party because you actually end up being with other like-minded people, which even the devil was operating in the spirit of heresies in the heavens when he got casted out because he didn't want to worship Adam. So all those that didn't want to worship Adam cleaved unto him and they became a party and they all were cast down together. 
right? So you can see how heresies actually affect the body. Continue, Casa, please. Heresy, sect. Right. So we get to see that heresies are going to come among us in the church. And we see that it's for the trying of our faith. Right. So we actually have to not be in agreement with the heresies. And that's how it actually tries us. Because the way heresies usually work, they operate with gal and slander. All right. That's just two of the things that heresies may operate in. But just giving an example. Um, so if I am bringing forth something that's different than the perspective of Alahayim, one, it's the spirit of God that's operating in me because I'm leading people away from the law. I'm leading people away from the spirit of Alahayim. And the first thing I have to do, I have to disprove. So that's where the slander comes in. I have to disprove the law in order to bring you to another law. So we have to be very, very on guard as the body not to give in to these things and to actually correct them, which is actually our duty when we hear them. Um, let's jump into James chapter 3, verse 17, um, so that we can see that the spirit of Alahayim is not partial nor hypocritical. Okay. James chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So now we're getting the perspective of Alahayim. These are the things that we should be focused on, or how we should view things. First, the wisdom is pure. It's peaceable. So if we're in agreement with the spirit of Alahayim, these are the things that we're going to operate in. We're going to be pure. We're going to be peaceable. We're going to be gentle. We're going to be easy to be entreated of. Someone can come and ask us a question without us being angered or in strife or offended. We're going to be full of mercy for when someone's going through something. Of good fruits, we're going to bring forth good fruit because we're operating in the same spirit as Alahayim and we have the same outlook and perspective. We're going to be without partiality. Why? Because we have the same perspective as Alahayim. We're not lukewarm. We're not seeing things from our own understanding or our own desires at some points and then seeing things from Alahayim and his perspective at others, right? And we're going to be without hypocrisy because we're not going to do those things. We're not going to be partial because we're going to be in agreement with Alahayim wholly and completely. Not to cleave unto him when it's convenient for us or to speak of what's right in doing another so we're not supposed to be partial following the one true spirit. So let us be mindful that righteous reasoning helps us see clearly to not be partial with our brothers and sisters, but instead reasoning with the law and the fruits of the spirit to guide us in impartiality or to impartiality. All right. Can we read uh, 4th Maccabees chapter 2? I'm going to stop you a good bit through here just to let you know. All right. For oh, Maccab to verse 5. Sorry. No problem. Verse 5. For the law says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Verily, when the law orders us not to covet, it should, I think, Confirm strongly the argument that reason is capable of controlling covetous desires, even as it does the passions that militate against justice. For the law ranks above affection for parents, so that a man may not, for their sakes, surrender his virtue. All right, so let's understand that. The law ranks above affection. So if we have that perspective of Alahayim, we're going to hold the law 
first and foremost, all right? That's going to be the epitome of everything. And by that being the greatest or the 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 peak of our desire or what we hold or we reverence to the highest extent, we're not going to surrender our virtue to our parents if they're contrary to it or if they're trying to make us do something that's contrary to the law, being of respect to persons of our parents, seeing that they're doing something that is not right according to Allah or his perspective or his spirit. So the law ranks above affection for parents, right? And that's the reasoning that we have to have. We have to reason within ourselves that our reverence for our parents doesn't cause us to, to veer off from what's right in the sight of Allah Hayyam. All right, continue, Kasa. And it overrides love for a wife so that if she transgress, a man should rebuke her. Right, and it overrides the love for a wife so you don't want to be blinded by the love of your wife and put that above the law of Allah Hayyam. Because what happens is, if you put your wife above the law of Allah Hayyam, or your husband above the law of Allah Hayyam, you're going to be a respecter of persons and you're going to you're going to wink at their folly. When they do something wrong, you're not going to want to correct them for the love that you have for them, which is not actually love. So we get to see that that same law overrides the love of a wife because it's supposed to be held at a higher regard. For Allah is supposed to be first according to 1 Corinthians 11. So we see that Allah is here. Christ is here, then the man. Right? So we can't we can't facilitate and put something above Allah. So if she transgress, a man should rebuke her, a man should correct her. Right. And that's because the law is first and not the wife. Okay. So we have we have to have things in proper perspective so that we can actually keep the law and we can actually walk in one spirit with Allah. Hayyam. Continue, Casa, please. And it governs love for children, so that if they are naughty, a man should punish them. Right. And it governs that same law and that same reasoning of the law, it governs the love of our children so that when our children aren't doing right, we're not, we're not turning a blind eye to them or we're not laughing at their folly. If they're not doing what's right, they get corrected. And that law is actually what actually does it because if that law is held at that high regard and it's the highest regard that we have then it's not hard to do what's right according to it seeing that that is our perspective but if we have another perspective it becomes hard and we don't want to do it because another law enters into our hearts so we actually get to see that that perspective and how sh strong perspective is to cause us not to be partial toward Allah Hayyam, which is the ultimate thing. Of course, not being partial to our brothers and sisters, but if we can actually strive and actually come out of being partial to Allah Hayyam, that same spiritual growth is going to come into the physical. So we have to strive in both of them so that we can be complete. Um, let's continue, Brother Casa, please. And it controls the claims of friendship so that a man should reprove his friend if they do evil. All right. So you see that same law and that same perspective and holding that high regard controls our claims for our friendships that we will reprove our friend and not be afraid to correct them for the sake of being at peace with them. All right. So these are the things that we have to do and be mindful of being in the perspective of Allah Hayyam. 
so that we can actually do what's right in his sight and not what's right in our own. Having favoritism or unfair biasness toward Elohim. I'll continue, Brother Kata, please. And do not think it a paradoxical thing when reason through the law is able to overcome even hatred. Right. And the rule of reason is likewise proved to extend through the more aggressive passions or vices, ambition, vanity, ostentation, pride, and backbiting. So that's interesting. Why is reasoning so powerful to actually get us through even hatred or pride or backbiting or ambition? Why is reasoning so powerful um let's continue casa please verse 16 for the temperate mind repels all these debased passions even as it does anger for it conquers even this right all right let's keep going um keep going and we're going to get into we're going to get the answer yay moses when he was angered against dathan and abiram did not give free course to his wrath, but governed his anger by his reason. Right. So he didn't operate or he didn't act in the anger, though he was angry. He didn't act in the anger because of reasoning. So let us, too, keep the law and the fruits of the spirit in the forefront of our minds and focus on our purpose of life unto Elohim and doing his will. If we find our mind fleeing from the law and the fruits of the spirit, let us catch ourselves to refocus and examine why we're drifting away and reason within ourselves to gain understanding of what's important in our goal and focus to stay on the right track, which is the law and the fruits entering back into our hearts and minds to focus on. All right, let's continue reading so we can actually get the understanding of why reasoning is so powerful to overcome these things. For the temperate mind is able, as I said, to win the victory over the passions, modifying some while crushing others absolutely. Interesting. All right. So the temperate mind is able because reasoning is part of being temperate. The temperate mind is able because to reason, you actually have to be slow. You can't be hasty to reason. Because if you're hasty in your actions or your words or your doings, you can't be temperate because they're contrary to one another. So you actually get to see that temperance and reasoning actually go hand in hand. And that's what we should be doing to increase us in our temperance is to be reasoning within ourselves as to what is right and what is wrong and why it's right. And that's why it's able to win the victory over passions because what it does is it modifies some when you reason within yourself and you see, okay, that's not right because of the law. Okay, so let me reason with myself to fix what I'm doing that's wrong. So I can modify some some of the things it can fix. Some of the things can be um, can be altered and say, okay, I can just alter this and I can make this right according to the law. It can fit in the law. And some things have to be completely crushed because it doesn't fit in the law at all. So that reasoning actually helps alleviate and to, to do process of elimination for the things that are good and right in the sight of Allah and are of his perspective and the things that's not. So this is what we need to do when we're examining ourselves of something that we may be doing or that we may catch. We also have to add temperance with reasoning after our examination so that we can actually come up with a solution. All right, so some have to be modified and reshaped to fit into the law, and some we have to flee from, seeing that no good fruit comes from it. 
All right, so let's continue, Brother Costa, please. Verse 19. Why else did our wise father Jacob blame the house of Simeon and Levi for their unreasoning slaughter of the tribe of the Shechemites, saying, A curse be their anger? For had not reason possessed the power to restrain their anger, he would not have spoken thus. For in the day when Allah created man, he implanted in him his passions and inclinations, and also, at the very same time, set the mind on a throne amidst the senses to be his sacred guide in all things. Now look at that. For the day when Allah created man, he implanted in him his passions. So Allah actually, we were actually viewing things from the perspective of Allah Everything that we understood was from the perspective of Allah We had Allah passions, we had Allah inclinations, right? And set the mind upon us on a throne amidst the senses to be his sacred guide in all things. So we were guided by the perspective of Allah. Even as you see with Adam at the beginning, he was guided by the perspective of Allah. There was no other contrary passion or no other contrary perspective that he was operating in or that he viewed or that he seen. So this is the same for us. We have to get back to actually the way that we were created, that we actually have the same passion and inclinations as Allah. That's why when we see children, children come out and they have that same passion or inclination because that's how Allah creates us in the beginning. That's why he said, if, if we bring back our spirit with any other spirits that he didn't give unto us, then we're a thief and a robber. So we have to make sure that we get back to seeing things from Allah perspective, even as children, because children don't understand when you say something and you say you're going to do something, they expect you to do it because they are implanted with the inclinations of Allah. They see things from his viewpoint and it's only the world and how we're affected by the world that actually gets us away from that viewpoint that we were implanted with from the beginning. They're going to hold you to your word, which is actually right because they're actually holding you accountable of what you say so that you're not lying. So even with that example, we get to see how children are implanted. We can see it in the earth. We can see it being tangible to see that Allah word is true, that he implants his passion and his inclination to his perspective into us from when we're born. Right? So we have to get back to that. Um, continue, Brother Casa, please. And to the mind he gave the law, by which, if a man order himself, he shall reign over a kingdom that is temperate and just and virtuous and brave. And look at that. He said, and to the mind he gave the law. We're supposed to keep the law on our minds. That's what keeps us in the perspective of Allah. By the which, if a man order himself, if we keep fast and hold fast to that and order ourselves in the law, that means to keep ourselves subordinate to, we're going to reign. We're going to get the victory. We're going to have the perspective of Allah. We're going to have the, the viewpoint or the outlook of Allah which is going to help us keep the law in all things, which is going to help us not be ashamed of doing what's right in the sight of Allah, even in a perverse generation. Uh, continue, Brother Casa, please. You got something? Yeah, that Paul yeah. talks about in 1 Corinthians 2 and 16, we have the mind of Christ. And Christ's mindset in Psalms 40 and 8 was, I delight to do thy will, O my Allah, Yea, thy law is within my heart. Mm -hmm. So 
we're definitely on track of what we're supposed to be building towards. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Casa. All right. Chapter you... three. Okay. Chapter three, verse one. For reason is not shown to be master over the passions or defects in itself, but over those of the body. Now, here we go. So reason helps us overcome the works of the flesh. Look at that. For reason is not shown to be master over passions or defects in itself. So reason isn't going to stop you from liking what you like. Right? Or it's not going to stop you from doing something that's habitual. Because you actually have to put in the work to stop that or to make a choice. Right? It's the actual choice that actually stops you from doing those things. Reasoning just leads you to making the choice. So that's why reason is not shown to be master over passions or defects in itself. Because even though you're reasoning, you still have to make a choice. And the choice is what actually gets you over the passions and the defects or the habitual habits. But reasoning helps you to get over those of the body by making you have to make a choice or getting you to the point to have to make a choice. So we get to see how powerful reasoning through temperance is because it slows you down to actually examine and to view things and to weigh things out so that you can actually make a proper choice. Let's continue, Casa. You got anything? No, that's this next verse says what you're saying. For example, none of you is able to extirpate our natural desire, but the reason can enable him to escape being made a slave by desire. Right. So that reasoning actually helps us to examine what's going on with us. Saying, hey, I'm having a problem stopping this. What is going on? Now I need to reason within myself and to reason with Allah Hayyam and to pray to then understand what is causing me to be a slave to my desire where I can't stop doing something. So reasoning in itself is not the master of passions and defects, but it actually leads us to understand what's happening so that we can actually truly make a choice and reason how we should operate or what we should do to come out of what is hindering us. So you can see how powerful reasoning is, yet we still have to make that choice. Once we get to the point of understanding in our reasoning. Right. Continue, Hassel, please. None of you is able to extirpate anger from the soul, but it is possible for the reason to come to his aid against anger. Right. So just like the scripture says, be ye angry and sin not. And then it says, uh, sit upon thy bed. Right. What are you doing when you sit upon your bed? You're supposed to be reasoning. So you can see how reason comes to the aid against anger. Because you reason as to why it's not right. Why it's not right to act in the anger. Sit down and think and reason. Okay, I know I feel like I'm justly angered. But is it right, according to the perspective of Allah Hayyam? Is it right according to the law? Is it right according to the fruits of the Spirit? So then you actually take the time to actually understand what you're actually doing. 
without being hasty to give yourself over without reasoning, without being temperate. Which temperance is a fruit of the spirit. So we know that that's the perspective of Alahayim is to be temperate. Then we have to actually implement that in our lives and walk in it. So that we can actually extirpate anger from the soul by the reasoning and the choice. Right. By getting over it in that in that instance. All right. So we can't stop ourselves from from being angry um, as our reaction, but we can extirpate the anger by righteous reasoning and temperance after. Right. Extirpate means to root out and destroy completely. Mm -hmm. Just in case anybody is wondering. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Using this word, man. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Gotham. None of you can extirpate a malevolent disposition, but reason can be his powerful ally against being swayed by malevolence. Do you have the definition for malevolence? Malevolent is having or showing a wish to do evil to others. So evil desire, All right? So unfortunately, some of us, we have that perspective to do evil. We have a malevolent disposition. That's our mindset, right? So a lot of us, we can't take away that, that evil desire or that intent, but by reason, it can be a powerful ally against being swayed by malevolence because malevolence is going to come. That thought is going to come to try to get us to go a different direction. But through the reasoning of Alahayim and through the reasoning of the law and the fruits of the spirit, it actually helps extinguish and be a powerful ally against it where we don't operate in it. Yeah. Right. So for many of us and really all of us, we all are attacked with thoughts that are not right according to the fruits of the spirit and not right according to the law. So we actually get to see, hey, reasoning, reason is a powerful ally against that. So let's slow down and actually reason within ourselves to see if that's a good thought or not and not just acting upon it. Along with that, Paul talked about how in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, you know, the weapons are warfare and not carnal. Mm -hmm. As we're talking about setting the law in our mind, the fruits of the spirit as our weapons, we say casting down imaginations, so those thoughts of malevolence, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Allah and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So this, we see that these spirits, they're going to come. These thoughts, right. these desires, these passions, we have to understand this is a constant work. It's not going away. We just have to get better at catching it and subduing it to the thoughts of Christ. Right. So we grow in the mind of Christ for perspective to know not to get down because this thought's still coming. That's what they're going to do until the end. Okay? Right. That's why I said none of you can extirpate a malevolent disposition. Like you can't extinguish it. It's going to come. But reason is a powerful ally against it so that you're not swayed by it. So right. you're not overtaken by it or, or operating or act in it. Right. right. So it's it's definitely a work, just like Brother Kostafo said, to actually um, first get to the place of catching it before you actually operate in it, that is definitely a step. And then, you know, get into the place where you're quick to extinguish it through reasoning. 
Continue, Casa, whenever you're ready. All right. Reason is not the extirpate of passions, but their antagonist. Right. So reason is the opposite of passion and can extinguish it. All right. So we get to see that reason is the opposite of passion because passion gets us into our feelings and into our emotions, which causes us to be rash or hasty. But reasoning is the opposite. Right. So it's the antagonist of passion. Right. So that's great understanding to have. Continue, Casa, please. The temperate mind is able to conquer the dictates of the passions and to quench the fires of desire mm -hmm. and to wrestle victoriously with the pangs of our bodies, though they be exceeding strong, and by the moral beauty and goodness of reason to defy with scorn all the domination of the passions. All right, so let's understand this. It says, for the temperate mind is able to conquer, right? So as we've been going through this, you actually get to see why the temperate mind is able to conquer because it's slowing down and reasoning so that you can actually make a proper choice and not a hasty choice being influenced by your own desire or your own um, passions, right? Now, the dictates of the passion and to quench the fires of the desire because say a, a fit of passion comes upon you and you are strongly led to do something because of your passion. If you actually apply that temperance and reasoning in that situation, you can actually come out of it if that's what you truly desire and you make a choice. It says, and to wrestle victoriously with the pains of our bodies, though they be exceeding strong. So say the lust of the flesh is coming over you and your, your fire is coming over you and you have that, you have a desire for carnal union. Through reasoning, you can actually come out of it. Through being temperate and through reasoning, you can actually come out and say, hey, okay, that's fornication. Hey, that's adultery. Hey, that's the, the works of the flesh. That's lust that's working in me. What do I need to do to come out of it? And if it's truly your desire to come out of it, Allah is going to make a way for you to come out of it. And he's going to give you the reasoning as to cleave unto for you to actually overcome that desire and that in that moment of passion. So we actually get to see how powerful reasoning is with temperance if we're actually applying it and it's what we desire to do. If we desire to do what's right in the sight of Allah, to be walking according to his perspective and his law and his fruits of the spirit. All right. So this reasoning with temperance is very strong for us. It's a very strong, a very strong um, ally. So let us therefore reason how we resisted unto blood, how we truly stood against our own desires to come out of them so that we may be one with Allah as Ahaya Yache and Ruach Kodoshi are one. Have we truly done that? Let's read uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 through 15, please. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. All right. So let us keep in our minds Yahweh's sacrifice for us. All right. So if we consider him that endured, it's going to help give us more motivation for us to endure too. Continue, Katha. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Right. So we have to resist unto blood, striving against sin. And it has to be a choice that we make that we actually want to do it. Reasoning in our minds to help us complete the task, but ultimately making the choice through our reasoning, 
and not being partial or not being a hypocrites to cause us to to not truly resist. Okay, go ahead, Casa. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, no faint when thou art rebuked of him. And this, a lot of times, is one of the major things that cause people to not um, want the perspective of Allah. This is one of the major things that causes people to not want to do what's right in the sight of Allah because Allah holds people accountable. And those of the faith, if you're walking after Allah, you're going to hold people accountable too because you have the same perspective of Allah and you're walking in the law of Allah and the fruits of the spirit. So this chastening of the Lord and also the law that rebuke thy friend it it causes a division because many people don't want to be corrected and that's where we truly have to come into the perspective of Allah to see that Allah corrects us and chastens us and the reason why and being in agreement with the reason why it happens so we actually get to really get the perspective of Allah so that we can understand and be in agreement with him. Go ahead, Casa, please. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. All right, so we have to keep that in our minds to understand that the Lord loves us. That's why he chastens us. Because if he left us unto ourselves, to be willful, then that's not love. So he corrects us because he loves us. So we have to to turn our, or to 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 reform our perspective, so that our perspective can match the perspective of Allah, and that we may not have our own perspective, which causes us not to serve Allah. Continue, Casa, please. If you endure chastening, Allah dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? All right. All right. Continue, Cousin. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, there's the distinct difference. It's easy for us to receive when we're corrected, not according to the law. This is spiritual. He says, for verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. So they were chasing you based off of how they wanted something to be. And we can receive that. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. So as soon as we start, you start being chastened by the law, it's spiritual. It's not carnal anymore. So if you have a spirit that's operating in you that is struggling in an area or several areas, you're not going to be in agreement or you're not going to be happy with the chastening because it's rattling the spirit that's dwelling in you. And it makes it very uncomfortable. And a lot of times, if that spirit has a root in you, say the spirit of rebellion, if that spirit has a root in you, it's going to, to shake you away and to get you far away from whatever it is that's correcting you so that it can stay dwelling in you. 
So we have to be very mindful of this to understand that when Allah is chastening us, it's for our profit. Because he sees something in us that we may not see ourselves or want to see ourselves. But it's for our life that we may be partakers of his holiness. So we have to be very mindful of walking in our own perspective. This is why it's so key. This own perspective is so key in truly conforming to Allah perspective because it leads us astray from Allah and it leads us away from doing what's right according to Allah and being in agreement with him. Because if someone is chastening or correcting me and I don't agree with what they say, what am I going to do? I'm going to cast it away from me. I'm going to rebel against it. So you can see how key this is for our salvation. You got anything on that, Casa? You said it straight. That's right. Um, I'm ready when you are. Verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Right. So we have to think about um, Barnabas, chapter 19, verse 6. The, um, the accident that befall us receiveth good, knowing that nothing cometh but by Allah am. So it may not seem joyous if that is our perspective, you see, because as we grow in our perspective being unto Allah, we will see the good quickly because that's what we want to see. That's why I said the accident that befall us receive is good. Because it's possible for us to receive it as good and not as bad. But we know that when we're actually striving for something and we're trying to change from habits, it may be difficult. So it may not seem joyous and it may seem grievous. But afterward, it's going to yield fruit if we actually hearken unto it. if we actually hearken unto it and walk in it and make the proper change. Right. So we have to have that perspective. We have to grow in that perspective and be quick to receive things, receive chastening or correction, knowing that it's helping us to come out of something that we may not see ourselves. And let not pride enter into our hearts because we don't see something ourselves and someone else is able to see it. To then refute it. But allow us to receive it and examine ourselves and to reason within ourselves through temperance so that we can actually see it and make a choice. That we can work toward changing our perspective. You got something, Costa? I see you over there looking. That, well, it looked like Paul was, you know, he was helping us as we are men where we can see it possibly that is grievous. But if our mind is set on the law, it said, um, whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully and be patient when thou art changed to a low estate in Sarat 2 and 4. So, even in perspective, we have the law to help us stay in the right spirit so that we go through it in the right spirit. And in the end, we're going to come out on the right side, having the fruits of righteousness being brought forth by the exercise and of taking heed to what Allah is bringing upon us for mm -hmm. our ability to partake in his holiness. Right. Amen. It's a work. We just can't get, we can't get sidetracked of what's the focus and what's important to us. 
which are everyone's focus or everyone's top priority should be the law and the fruits of the spirit. And if we hold that to a high regard and a high standard, then it's going to make it easier for us to be in agreement. And then therefore it makes it easier for us to receive the chastening of the law if we're doing something that's not of it. Right? So that's where humility comes involved. And that is, of course, the perspective of Eliam. So we actually have to have that perspective and that outlook in all things. Continue, Katha, please. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. So don't get down about it. Mm -hmm. Don't get down when you're corrected or when you're chastened. All right, go ahead. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Right. So when the chastening comes or the correction comes, you have to look at it from the perspective that it's making straight the path for your feet. It's helping you to walk straightly instead of going or veering off to the left hand or to the right. At least that which is lame be turned out of the way. So if you don't take heed and you rebuke it, you're going to continue to veer off of the path. You're going to continue not to walk forward, but you're going to slightly turn left or right. So eventually you're going to be far away from the perspective of Alahayim. So that's what we don't want. But let it rather be healed. Rather that you take heed to it, examine it, reason, reason in it, and then make the choice to come out of it or to make the change. Continue, Casa, please. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Okay. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of Allah Hayyam, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, it's interesting that he says that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. He says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of Allah Hayyam. That is so interesting. Looking diligently. So when the correction comes or the chastening comes, you have to examine very diligently. Because if you don't examine very diligently and you just take it lightly and you just toss it away after you lightly examine, it's going to make you fail of the grace of Allah. And what happens? Because that person may have chastened you, or Alahayim may have chastened you with something, and you don't see it because you didn't look diligently, what's going to happen? The root of bitterness is going to spring up and trouble you. You're going to be upset with that person, or you're going to have a problem with Alahayim or that person. And many people are defiled by that not truly wanting to see something and looking over things and not being diligent in their own self-examination. So let this not be us. Let us truly want to see it and to conform to the perspective of Allah Hayyam, not be impartial so that we can actually see ourselves very diligently and correct ourselves or accept the chastening or the correction and then making the necessary changes. So let's therefore reason in the spirit that we may gain impartiality in the flesh. Can we read 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21, please? Sure. 1 Timothy 5 and 21. I charge thee before Allah I am and the Lord Yahweh Christ, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Right. So partiality 
goes for Elohim as well. We're not to prefer one over another. Not the father over the son or mother, and not the mother over the father or son, and nor the son over the father and mother, loving them all the same and having the same reverence. And by doing that, that actually helps us come out of partiality. Because as we see, some, some groups, they lift up or exalt one greater than the other. But if we have that same love for the Father as we do for the Son, as we do for the Holy Spirit, it helps us to come out of being partial or to be a respecter of persons and allows us to be the same towards all. And, by, and it helps us in our physical because if we have that perspective and we're growing in that mindset, it helps us also in the physical, to do the same. Now, let us look at an example of an impartial church to follow for our example. Um, can we read 1 Clement chapter 1, verse 3? Then we're going to jump into chapter 2. Okay. 1 Clement 1 and 3. For you did all things without respect of persons, and ye walked after the ordinances of Allah Submitting yourselves to your rulers and rendering to the older men among you the honor which is their due. On the young too, you enjoyed modest and seemly thoughts. And the women ye charged to perform all their duties in a blameless and seemly and pure conscience, cherishing their own husbands as is meet. And ye taught them to keep the rule of obedience and to manage the affairs of their household in seemliness with all discretion. All right. I want to read this again. I'm going to um, stop you in a couple of spots because I really, this is really important. Okay. Chapter 1, verse 3 of First Clement. For well, you did all things without respect of persons. So they weren't partial. All right. So this is our example for an impartial church. We want to see the things that they're doing so that we can actually have that same perspective of Allah and we can walk in the same ways and view things the same. So they did all things without respect to persons. So they weren't partial and they weren't um, looking upon the flesh. They were looking at the spirit, seeing what people were doing or the habits that someone was, was was going through and they were chastening and correcting one another in love so that everyone could obtain to the same the same standard that we all are striving for and that we all should be striving for. All right, continue, Kasa. And ye walked after the ordinances of Allah Hayyam. And ye walked after the ordinances of Allah Hayyam. That means that they were actually doing it and they weren't just speaking it. They weren't hypocrites. So they were actually doing what they were saying. Continue, Casa. So they had that perspective of Allah. I am. Submitting yourselves to your rulers and rendering to the older men among you the honor which is their due. So they were humble. They weren't lifting themselves up trying to get their own glory but they were submitting themselves to the rulers, to the people that Allah had placed and gave the wisdom and understanding to help them. They were submitting themselves to them so that they could actually learn. And they rendered to the older men the honor, which if they do, they respected their elders. They were keeping the law. They honored their fathers and mothers. Continue, Casa. On the young too, ye enjoyed modest and seemly thoughts. Right. So they were actually helping the children have the perspective of Allah and not doing what's right in their own sight. Nor implementing what's right according to the parents that's contrary to Allah They were doing all things according to the law and the fruits of the spirit. And teaching those things and doing those things. 
this is a great church. Continue, Katha, please. And the women ye charge to perform all their duties in a blameless and seemly and pure conscience. So they were teaching the women to do what's right always. Not to go out of the way when it's convenient or when it fits their desire. But to do all things blameless. That means they're blameless before Allah Hayyam. That means that they're doing what Allah Hayyam has instructed them to do. Seemly. I mean that they're walking orderly and of a and of a pure conscience. That means that they don't have an ulterior motive. They're not double-minded. They're not operating in guile. Not seeking after their own in charity. Mm -hmm. Continue, Kat. Cherishing their own husbands as is meat. Right. It says cherishing their own husbands. I mean, it's not taking them for granted. Which is very, very big. Because a lot of our women lightly esteem their husbands in this day and age. But to cherish your husband, you're holding him at a high regard. You're reverencing him. And by a woman reverencing her husband, she'll be obedient to him. And she'll listen to what he has to say for the great reverence that she has for him. But if you lightly esteem your husband, you're not going to want to hear what he has to say. Because you're operating in a perspective that's contrary to Allah Hayyam. Continue, Casa, please. And ye taught them to keep in the rule of obedience. In the rule of obedience. And ye taught them to keep in the rule of obedience. Ye taught them to stay within the law. Not to veer off on the left hand or to the right according to their own desire, their own perspective. Go ahead, Kass. And to manage the affairs of their household in seemliness with all discretion. Right. To be vigilant. To do all things in seemliness. Right. Not walking unorderly, but keeping the law always, even in your house. You have to be the same person everywhere. Not only when you're in front of people, but you have to be that same person even when you're by yourself, within your house, with all discretion, discretion of the law. This has to be our perspective. It can't just be our perspective when we're in front of the people of the church or we're in front of people that we want to be esteemed in front of, but this has to be our perspective always even when we're by ourselves. Continue, Kata, please. And we're first Clement chapter 2, verse 1. And you were all lowly in mind, and free from arrogance, yielding rather than claiming submission. Now here we go. They were all lowly in mind and free from arrogance. So no one was walking in pride to lift themselves up or to seek their own glory. They were coming to learn and not trying to control. They were yielding rather than claiming submission. They came and humbled themselves that they may learn and not feeling like they already understood or trying to come and have control or dominion over things because that's the perspective some people struggle with the perspective of not being in control of things which goes into their walk with Allah Hayyam, trying to control Allah Hayyam, or trying to to shape Allah Hayyam to be according to their own desires this is the same control and they operate in that same control Unto the church as well. Not being able to submit themselves. But 
rather getting upset when something isn't going their way or the way that they feel it should go. We have to be mindful of this. Continue, Casa, please. More glad to give than to receive and content with the provisions which Allah Hayyam supply us. So no one was seeking their own glory, but coming to glorify Allah Hayyam and thankful for their portion. They were content. It's a great example of a church. Continue, Casa, please. And giving heed unto his words, you lay them up diligently in your hearts. And his sufferings were before your eyes. Right. So as we spoke of before, it said giving heed unto his words. So having the law on your mind, giving heed unto his words. So that's the, the, the peak or the precipice of our focus and we laid them up diligently in your heart that means you held it at a high regard so if it's held at a high regard to you then you're going to remember it because that's how you lay them up in your heart and his suffering were before your eyes just like we read in i think it was hebrews that yache suffering it helps us to understand and to continue and to, to have that confidence or that inspiration to continue ourselves, knowing that we're going through the same thing that he went through so that we may endure our suffering with joy and not be grieved about it. Continue, Casa, please. Thus a profound and rich peace was given to all and an insatiable desire of doing good, an abundant outpouring also of the Holy Spirit fell upon all. So look, if we do these things to have that outlook or that perspective of Allah Hayim, and we are truly reasoning, examining, reasoning, and, and making a choice within ourselves, look at the fruit that it brings forth. It said, thus a profound and rich peace was given to all and an insatiable desire of doing good. So they were changing their perspectives. Their perspectives were changing as a whole, as a body. And an abundant outpouring also, the Holy Spirit fell upon them all. So because their perspective changed, and because they were walking in the ways of Allah not walking after their own desires or their own lust, the Holy Spirit was given unto them. So now we see how to operate so that the Holy Spirit may dwell with the body. Let's continue, Casa, please. And being full of holy counsel, in excellent zeal, and with a pious confidence, you stretched out your hands to Almighty Allah supplicating him to be propitious if unwillingly ye had committed any sin. Mm -hmm. So being full of holy counsel, that's the reasoning. They were reasoning. They were examining and reasoning within themselves. In excellent zeal and with pious confidence, you stretched out your hands to it. Allah Almighty, and they started praying for things they didn't understand. So that they actually were seeking to do what was right, seeking to change their perspective. They wanted it. They wanted the chastening. They wanted to get it right. And this is where we have to be. We have to want to get it right not just going through the motions or wanting it sometimes and then wanting what we want sometimes and being fickle in our ways, but supplicating him to be propitious. And if we do something wrong, if we do something unwillingly on accident or something that we were ignorant to, 
and we had committed any sin, we repent quickly. So when they were shown the fault, they would repent quickly. Because their desire, their perspective was to get it right. And was to be on one accord with Alahayim. To actually see and to view things and to operate as he operated. So that they could actually partake in his holiness. Let's continue, Casa, please. Ye had conflict day and night for all the brotherhood, that the number of his elect might be saved with fearfulness and intentness of mind. Right. So we had conflict day and night for all the brotherhood. We're all striving to get it right. That the number of his elect might be saved with fearfulness and intentness of mind. That's that striving. We're striving to get it right. We're striving to overcome. And if we have that same perspective and mindset, we're going to overcome too. Because it's a work. It's a work to get out of the, the habitual perspective that we've gained from the world. And to cleanse our vessel to get back to the way Allah wants us to be, being in agreement with him in all things. Continue, Kapsa, please. Ye were sincere and simple and free from malice one towards another. Every sedition and every schism was abominable to you. Now you see the mindset we must have for us to stay in one doctrine, one gospel, and one spirit. This perspective would keep us away from partiality. Every sedition and every schism was abominable to them. Anyone that was operating in another spirit or had another perspective than that of Alahayim or that of what was being taught they it was abominable to them and that's how we have to be we can't welcome slander we can't welcome backbiting we can't allow the thief and robber to come into the midst of the sheep and it's our duty to not give place to it It actually becomes our transgression if we actually give place to it. Continue, Casa, please. Ye mourned over the transgressions of your neighbors. Ye judged their shortcomings to be your own. All right. So they weren't looking just to exalt themselves. They mourned over the transgressions of their neighbors. Because they felt their pain. They had empathy. They know it's hard. And that's what helps encourage one another and sharpen one another. That's iron sharpened if iron is having that empathy and mourning over the transgressions instead of looking down upon them and casting them down to lift yourself up. You judge their shortcomings to be your own. If we have that perspective and that mindset that those in the body of Yahche and those that are striving, their shortcomings are our own, then it gives us that compassion toward them. So these are perspectives of Alahayim that we have to implement. Continue, Kasa. You repented not of any well doing, but were ready unto every good work. So they were quick to do that, which is good, right? Go ahead, Casa. Being adorned with a most virtuous and honorable life, you performed all your duties in the fear of him. The commandments and the ordinance of the Lord were written on the tables of your hearts. So that's where we must keep them. Not trying to protect our image, by walking in humility, holding fast to the commandments of our Elohim. 
It said, you performed all your duties in the fear of him. So it has to be in all of our actions. It has to be in our perspective when it comes to everything. That we're not partial. Doing it sometimes or hypocritical. Doing it sometimes and then sometimes not. It has to be performed in all our duties. The fear of him has to be there. For we know Elohim is not a respecter of persons. Neither is he partial, nor do they operate in double standards. Can we get um, Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35, please? Sure. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that Elohim is no respect of persons. But in every nation, he that fareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. All right. So Elohim has a standard. And it's not a double standard. He holds all of us to the same standard. It's not, it's not an unfair bias. He's not partial. There's a line... And that's what it is. That's his perspective. And that's what it is. We have to conform to him, not him conform to us. And that's what we need to understand and to humble ourselves so that we may actually do it. That Allah may be glorified and not us being glorified. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 18, and we're going to go from 4 to about 32, so that we can actually understand that Elohim holds us accountable, and he's not an um, enabler. He actually makes sure that we do what we say, and he has a standard, and he holds everyone to the same standard so that we can actually understand and see that it's us that has to make the changes. Um, go ahead, Casa. Uh, Ezekiel 18 and 14, please. All right. Ezekiel 18. And 4, sorry. 18 and 4. I'm sorry. It's all good. Ezekiel 18 and 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debt of his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. Now look at that. These are the standards of Elohim. As we continue to read, we get to see the standard of how Elohim wants us to operate. So if we are holding ourselves to another standard, then we're in error. He said, if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, it's not what's lawful and right to us. It's what's lawful and right to Elohim. That word right is our perspective. It's his perspective. And it's our perspective to see as his perspective. All right, so we have to hold ourselves accountable. Because Elohim is going to hold us accountable. Continue, Casa, please. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly, he is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord Ahaya. Right. So we see the standard that Elohim has for us, right? Not being partial, not being a respecter of persons, 
but truly having the same standards for all of us that we all have to keep. So we're all walking according to the standard of Elohim. We will be in unity. But if we all have different standards, then you see where seditions and where heresies enter into the church. Continue, Casa, please. Verse 10. If he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any one of these things, and that doeth not any of those duties, but even hath eaten upon the mountains, and defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, hath committed abomination, hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. So we see that Elohim holds us to a standard and holds us accountable for our actions. So we have to be very mindful of that and not think that Elohim is not going to hold us accountable for the things that we do. Let us not be deceived by any spirit that lies to us and that causes us to go away from what Elohim is saying. Because these aren't man's words. These are the words of Elohim, and we actually have to conform to them. And if we can't conform to the words of Elohim, and we don't want to see it, and we want to omit his words, then we need to reason and examine ourselves so that we can actually conform and actually change our ways to turn from that which is not good in his sight to do what is good in his sight and right and just. Continue, Casa, please. Now, lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such like, so righteous reasoning. So we have a son that sees his father's iniquity and he considers it. He does righteous reasoning and temperance and he makes a choice not to do the same thing. All right, go ahead. That hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither oppressed any hath not withholding the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry and hath covered the naked with a garment that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. Mm -hmm. So you see that Allah has no double standard. He holds everyone to the same accountability and he's not going to put a punishment on one person because another person chooses to do what's wrong. He's not a respecter of persons and he has no double standards. Continue, Cosmo, please. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. So he gets to receive his own punishment. Allah doesn't impart the sins of one to another. Right? We all have the ability to reason and to examine so that we can actually do what's right in the sight of Allah and he all gives all of us the cognitive ability to then change our outlook and perspective. It's not that we're stuck in our ways. That's a choice. None of us are stuck in our ways. Every man can change if it's the desire for the man or woman to change. And we all have that cognitive ability. Continue, Casa, please. Yet say ye, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? 
when the son had done that which is lawful and right, and had kept all my statutes, and had done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Saith the Lord Ahiah, and not that he should return from his ways and live? So we see that is the perspective of Elohim. He doesn't have pleasure that someone should not want to conform or to change their ways to live unto him. But he does have pleasure that he should return from his ways and live. He wants us to actually change our perspectives that we may be able to see a right and see as Allah had originally placed in us with our passions and intentions. Go ahead. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, Shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Now look at that. Now, the people still had the perspective that Allah was operating in a double standard. Yet ye say the way of the Lord is not equal. That means that he has a double standard. But he just explained, and he explains all through the scriptures, that he holds us accountable. What spirit is it that's causing the people to see that Elohim operates in a double standard? All right, so you can see how the spirit of lying and how the spirit of deception is in their hearts that actually causes them to see through that perspective or through that lens. And if they don't want to examine it and they don't want to reason within themselves that, hey, the spirit of lying has a place in me or the spirit of deception has a place in me, they're going to stay in it and continue to see things from another perspective. Let's continue to see what Allah has to say. Yet ye say the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? All right. So men's ways are unequal. And because of the pride of men, they don't want to conform or to admit that they are wrong. And this is not the spirit that we want to be walking in, but we're not able to humble ourselves and say, okay, I was wrong and I was operating in another spirit. Let me correct. Let me reason. Let me examine. Let me reason so that I can now conform to the ways of Allah that I may be held accountable so that I can actually do what's right knowing that Allah is going to hold me accountable. Continue, Kassim. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and commences iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live. 
he shall not die. So we get to see the power of reasoning. We're going to continue to see that how important reasoning is with temperance, where it actually turns us away from doing that which is wrong and bringing us unto doing what's right, if that's truly what's in our heart to do, so that we can get to a place where it makes sense to us and we can make a choice, a clear choice. Go ahead, Kasim. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord Ahaya. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Well, now we get to understand a new heart and a new spirit. Because it says, turn yourselves from all your transgressions. We actually get to see what it takes to have a new heart and a new spirit. Because what we learned in the world created a new heart and a new spirit in us where we have our own perspective that's why it says everyone O house of israel everyone according to his ways because we learned these things in the world we learned our own way which was not from the beginning when we were created so now we need a new heart and a new spirit. We need a new perspective. We need a new spirit to walk in. We actually have to come back to the spirit of Elohim so that we can actually walk and do what he's commanded us to do. We need a new heart, seeing that our outlook comes from our heart and how we view things. Not viewing things according to Elohim's way, but viewing things according to our own or another. So we have to cast away our iniquities and our transgressions. And when that chastening comes or that correction comes, it's for our help to cast away our transgressions so that we can actually get to having a new heart and a new spirit. Continue constantly, please. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord Ahaya. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. So we have to understand that Allah is not partial, nor respect the persons, nor an enabler to pacify or justify our behavior that's against his commandments. No matter how we may view things contrarily, so we have examples of the priests walking in partiality. Now let us be mindful that this mindset can enter into any of our hearts and cause us to error, and not only the priest. Right. Um, let's read Malachi chapter 2, verse 1 through 9. Please. Malachi 2 and 1. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith Ahaya of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Now let's find out why he's saying they didn't lay it to heart. Uh, let's jump down to Malachi chapter 2 verse 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of Ahiah of hosts. All right, so now we know what laying at the heart means. 
right? So we got to see that the covenant was with him of life and peace. So he kept the commandments. He kept the law, right? He kept the covenant of his fathers, right? Fear was in him, and he was afraid before Allah of name. So he feared to do wrong, at least he would do wrong unto Allah Hayyam. The law of truth was in his mouth, so he kept the law, and he only spoke by the law, and he walked in the law. And iniquity was not found in his lips, right? So he didn't bring forth any other perspective. He walked with me in peace, so he, he walked in the law. And equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. So if you're speaking the law and doing it, you're not going to turn anyone away. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. So others are coming to gain from the priest. So the priest has to be doing things right in order not to lead anyone else astray. So now that we know what lay at the hearts means, what did the priests do? What did they actually do during that time? Go ahead, Kasa. Oh, his reasoning too. Remember, he put reason over his parents. He did what Allah Hayyam said, even though his father didn't want him to destroy the Shechemites. That fair. Verse 8. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Hayyam of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Now that's the interesting part. Of course they departed out of the way, and they caused me to stumble at the law because they were hypocrites. They would say the law. They wouldn't do it, and sometimes they would teach the law according to their own desires, which we're going to get into here. But it also says, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. So let's find out how the Levites were partial in the law. Uh, let's get the Testament of Levi chapter 14, verse 7, please. And ye shall be puffed up because of your priesthood, lifting yourselves up against men. And not only so, but also against the commands of Allah I am. For ye shall contemn the holy things with jest and laughter. Now, this is the interesting part. The Levites will make light of the law. Those Levites uh, that didn't do what was right. They will make light of keeping the law through their covetousness. They will put their lust before the commandments. So they had another perspective. Looking down upon others to lift themselves up so that they could justify their own sins against Allah Hayyam. So that's how the pride would operate. The more that they could see the sins of others, the more they felt justified to sin themselves. And we can also understand, if we continue reading, to understand why How they caused many to stumble at the law. Uh, let's continue. In verse 6. And out of covetousness ye shall teach the commandments of the Lord. Right. So they were teaching the commandments based on their own desires. Based off of what they wanted. So you can see how it caused many people to stumble at the law. Because it wasn't from the perspective of Allah. It was from the perspective of themselves. And we have to be mindful and examining and reasoning with ourselves to make sure that we're doing things according to the law and not according to our own desires. Um, thus leading them to do all things, whether carnal or spiritual, through the spirit of covetousness. So next we have another example of the Judites and their treacherous dealings, keeping the law when it's convenient and breaking it when going after their desire and trying to hide their faults. 
So this is something that a lot of us fall into that we can all be familiar with so that we can learn from it. Um, Malachi chapter 2, verse 10, please, Brother Constant. Okay, verse 10. Have we not all one father? Hath not one Allah created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah had dealt treacherously. An abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of Ahiah, which he loved, and had married the daughter of a strange Elohim. So here we go. So the Judites would serve Elohim, and when it's according to the desire, leave Elohim and his law to fulfill the desire of being partial. So that's why they would marry the daughter of a strange Elohim. That means that they were hearkening to an idol. Okay, let's continue. Ahiah will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto Ahiah of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of Ahiah with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more or receiveth it with good will at your hand. So this was what the Judites would do. After they will fulfill their lust, they will come crying and repenting of what they done, and it becomes a cycle that they continue to fulfill their lust, not willing to change their ways, though they knew it was wrong, being partial towards Elohim. So you can see the unrepentance and that's why he said that they married a strange woman because they wouldn't let her go they married her so they continued to operate with her not coming out of it so we have to be mindful that we're not just going in a cycle and going in and in, in just doing things in motion where we do something wrong we repent about it but yet we really don't examine ourselves and reason and make a choice to come out of it. We just continue to do it over and over and continue a cycle. Elohim is not pleased with that. He said that that's dealing treacherously. Right. Uh, let's continue, Casa, please. Yet ye say, wherefore? Because I have been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit. And wherefore one? That he might seek a holy seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. So we get to see again that how Allah created us in the beginning. The wife of our youth is the spirit in, in the understanding and the perspective that Allah gave us from when we were created. And we end up leaving that wife of our youth to go after a strange woman. And we deal treacherously against Allah. So we have to be very mindful of that to examine ourselves and to reason, to truly deeply examine ourselves and to reason so that we can come to the place where we actually can make a, a choice of what we actually want to do and what direction we actually want to go. Okay. You got anything on that, Kasa? No, I thought you. It was good. What okay. you said. All right, let's continue, please. Verse 16. For Ahaya, the Elohim of Israel, say that he hated putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith I of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. All right, so let us not try to hide our faults so that we can continue in them. All right, so we see that that's dealing treacherously too. All right. Let not the lust of our eyes cause us to walk in partiality either. Can we read James chapter 2, verse 1? through 12 please all right 
James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Yahweh Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, had not Allah chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? For ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if you have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So we have to stand for what's right according to the commandments of Allah and not out of respect the person's impartiality. As you see how this partiality can cause seditions. Uh, let's continue in James chapter 2 verse 10, please. Okay. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Allah is not an enabler, but holds us accountable. So he said, whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Because that one point is another spirit that has place in us. And Allah Hayyam didn't give us that spirit at the beginning when he created us. So it can't have place in us. Anything that causes us to deter from the law or to not be able to keep a law is spiritual. That means that there is something there that is stopping us or prohibiting us from actually doing it because the law is spiritual. So we have to be mindful of that. If there's something that's causing us not to be able to keep the whole law or causing us to offend at one point, that's something that we truly need to examine and to reason. Go ahead, Kasim. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Mm -hmm. So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Right. So speak ye and so do. So if we're going to speak it, let's do it. So our actions and our words have to match one another. Uh, we can't be hypocrites because that's the definition of a hypocrite is that we don't match. Our words and our deeds don't match with one another. Okay. So let's understand what the law of liberty is so that we can actually gain an understanding. Um, let's go to Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. And then we're going to jump over to James chapter 1 verse 23. Okay. Galatians 5 and 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So let's see exactly what Paul is talking about. Now let's go to James chapter 1, verse 23, so that we can actually understand what Christ made us free from. Verse 23 of James 1. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Mm -hmm. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we see that the law of liberty... It's the right for us to choose to keep the law or not without judgment from man according to the law. That's one of the things that Yahche brought forth was the law of liberty for us not to be judged according to the judgments of the law. Right? We actually have more time to get it together or to make a choice 
to do what's right. Uh, let's continue in Galatians uh, 5 and 13 through 15, please. Galatians 5 and 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. All right. So let's not use that liberty to sin, because that's not what the liberty is for. The liberty is for us to actually have more time to do what's right. Okay. So we, we don't want to use it as an occasion to the flesh, but we want to use it to serve one another. Right. And we're going to continue to understand what that means. Continue, Casa, please. For well, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Right. So the law of liberty gives us a chance to have more time to make a choice to serve Allah Hayyam. and in serving Allah Hayyam, we're going to do the things that are right according to Allah Hayyam's perspective which in turn allows us to love one another and to serve one another and to love our neighbor as ourselves right because that's Allah Hayyam's standard that's his perspective so it it all encompasses it all goes together all right. let's continue brother Kasa as, it, as Paul said, to whom you yield yourselves to obey, his servants you are whom you obey. Right. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. But look at that. So let us not judge one another, but help one another to be strengthened in the law and the fruits of the Spirit. Right? Because through the law of liberty, through Yache, we're not judged according to the law or the judgments by man. But if we go and start biting and devouring one another, trying to judge one another instead of helping one another, we're actually going to consume one another. We're actually going to cause each of us to fall. So we have to change that perspective and that mindset and we actually have to be just like um, Clement said, we actually have to take on other people's downfalls as our own. When people fall, we have to look at it as we fail to help them. We have to have that mindset, not to lift ourselves up against them, but to have that empathy toward them. So we see that seditions, partiality, Respect to persons and heresies in the church by not being in agreement only hurts the body and destroys the tower being built. So we all have our part to play in the body as First Clement 2 and 6 spoke about, that we esteem seditions and schisms abominable in our sights and speak against it, warn against it in the church. So that the spirit won't take root and Allah and willing, we can have a holy discourse to get on one accord in doctrine and belief. So let us be vigilant to not credit a person without truly knowing them and trying them by their life. Not by what they say, but by their lifestyle and how they operate. Let's look at the Testament of Asher chapter 4 verse 3 so we can get understanding of that and then we'll continue. That's some of the assets of the four, verse three. One man hateth the merciful and unjust man, and the man who committed adultery and fasted. This too hath a twofold aspect, but the whole work is good, because he followeth the Lord's example, in that he accepteth not the seeming good as the genuine good. So remember, let's try a man by his works and his life to know if they are a good servant or not. Now we have to strive to be impartial with all men and Allah I am the same. Can we get the definition of impartial, please? Sure. Impartial means treating all rivals or disputants equally, fair and just. Right. So we have to be fair and just across the board. Okay. That keeps us away from a double standard. That keeps us away from being partial. That keeps us away from being a respect of persons. That keeps us away from seditions. That keeps us away from heresies. So this impartiality 
is very strong. And let's jump into Shepherd and Hermes Mandate 7, chapter 1, verse 1. Hermes Mandate 7, chapter 1, verse 1. Fear the Lord, saith he, and keep his commandments. So keeping the commandments of Allah, I am, thou shalt be powerful in every deed, and thy doing shall be incomparable. For whilst thou fear the Lord, thou shalt do all things well. But this is the fear wherewith thou oughtest to be afraid, and thou shalt be saved. But fear not the devil, for if thou fear the Lord, thou shalt be master over the devil, for there is no power in him. For in whom is no power, neither is there fear of him. But in whom power is glorious, of him is fear likewise. For every one that hath power hath fear, whereas he that hath no power is despised of all. But fear thou the works of the devil, for they are evil. While then thou fearest the Lord, thou wilt fear the works of the devil, and will not do them, but abstain from them. Right. So let us be encouraged to not fear how people may perceive us for doing what's right according to Allah Hayyam, nor putting in the work and effort to change and reason the bad habits that causes us not to keep the commandments and serve Allah Hayyam. For the spirit of sedition, partiality, respect of persons, and the like show our rebellion towards Allah Hayyam and man. For we know that the spiritual is manifested in the physical, so let us be mindful and reason what spirits we want to dwell within our vessel and who we want to serve by our works and deeds. So let us fear the devil's works, but not fear the devil. And through that fear of Elohim, we will fear from doing the devil's works. Continue, Brother Casa, please. In verse 4, fear, therefore, is of two kinds. If thou desire to do evil, fear the Lord, and thou shalt not do it. If again thou desire to do good, fear the Lord, and thou shalt do it. Therefore, the fear of the Lord is powerful and great and glorious. Fear the Lord then, and thou shalt live unto him. Yea, and as many of them that keep his commandments as shall fear him, shall live unto Allah Wherefore, sir, say I, didst thou say concerning those that keep his commandments, they shall live unto Allah I am? Because, saith he, every creature feareth the Lord, but not every one keepeth his commandments. Those then that fear him and keep his commandments, they have life unto Allah I am. But they that keep not his commandments have no life in them. Now that's interesting because even as the scriptures say, it says, the devils know Allah Hayim and they fear. But fear alone doesn't cause you to keep the commandments. Because the devils don't keep the commandments. So we actually see that we have to live unto Allah Hayim. And by living unto Allah Hayim, we're actually in fear of him. And we're also keeping his commandments. That we may have life. It takes that fear and that reverence, and it also takes for us to do it also. So a lot of times, guile and slander, as I said before, goes hand in hand with partiality, respect to a person's sedition, schisms, and heresies. So be mindful of these devices as well. Let's touch on Shepherd of Hermes Mandate 2, chapter 1, verse 1, please. All right, Shepherd of Hermes Mandate 2. Chapter 1, verse 1, he said to me, Keep simplicity and be guileless, and thou shalt be as little children, and know not the wickedness which destroyeth the life of men. First of all, speak evil of no man, neither take pleasure in listening to a slanderer. Otherwise thou too that hearest shall be responsible for the sin of him that speaketh the evil, if thou believest the slander which thou hearest. For in believing it, thou thyself also wilt have a grudge against thy brother. So then thou shalt be responsible for the sin of him that speaketh the evil. Right. So we get to see what spirit it is that actually causes the, the heresies 
and the seditions. All right? Because if you believe the slander or you believe the person operating in guile, they're speaking, and guile is speaking from them, all right? You're going to hold a grudge against thy brother too. So, so now it starts creating a sedition. It starts creating a sect or a group that's not in agreement with the rest of the body. So we have to be very mindful of that spirit, of these spirits. Um, go ahead, Casa, please. Slander is evil. It is a restless demon, never at peace, but always having its home in factions. Right. So we see where slander dwells. Slander dwells in factions. It dwells in seditions. So we have to be very mindful of the spirit of slander or holding a grudge or being bitter against someone. At least it causes us to go away from the perspective of Allah and the commandments. Go ahead, Brother Casa, please. Refrain from it, therefore, and thou shalt have success at all times with all men. <laughs> but clothe thyself with reverence, wherein is no evil stumbling block. But all things are smooth and gladsome. All right. So let's put that reverence of Allah in our hearts to change our perspective to be at Allah perspective. Not seeing things according to our own, our own way, or our own desires, or how we feel that things should be, or how someone should operate. But let us therefore give place unto the law and the commandments and the fruits of the spirit. If it's not according to those then we can speak on it and we can correct it and we can have that righteous zeal for Allah. But let us not have a zeal for our own selves to then be holding someone to our standard that is not the standard of Allah. All right? So let's clothe ourselves in that reverence for Allah, seeing that his way is greater than our own and his way is right and good and pleasing so that we will be in agreement with Allah and that we won't lift ourselves up against those that are operating in the spirit of Allah and, and truly helping the body. Uh, continue, Kasa. Let's, let's get the definition for reverence, please. The definition of reverence is regard or treat with deep respect. All right. So this reverence should be to Allah and to man. Right, we should have that regard to treat them with deep respect. All right, so let's continue in uh, Shepherd Harmon's mandate too, please. Work that which is good, and of thy labors which Allah am giveth thee, give to all that I want freely, not questioning to whom thou shalt give and to whom thou shalt not give. Give to all, for to all Allah am desireth that there should be given of his own bounties. All right, so this is going to help us come out from being a respect of persons and being partial, right? So give unto all, right? And want freely, not questioning to whom thou shalt give, right? And to whom thou shalt not give, right? So just being the same to everyone. That same impartiality that we're striving for, loving Allah all three of them the same and not reverencing one above the other. It's the same reverence that we have to have toward our brothers and sisters, that we love them all the same and not loving one more than the other to cause us to have the spirit of slander to come into our hearts or guile to come into our hearts to then lead us to go according to another perspective. Let's continue, Kasa, please. They then that receive shall render an account to Allah why they received it and to what end. For they that receive in distress shall not be judged, but they that receive by false pretenses shall pay the penalty. So don't try to control or try to seek out why someone needs something. Unless it's brought forth to your awareness don't seek it 
because they have to answer to Elohim for what they done. It says, they that receive shall render an account to Elohim why they received it and to what end. For they that receive in distress shall not be judged. So if they truly needed it, Elohim is not going to judge them. He allowed you to do it to help them. But they that receive by false pretense shall pay the penalty. So you don't have to take it upon yourself or to have to control things or have to understand. You just have to do what's right. And that for us, for a lot of us, it makes it very, very hard to be selfless and to not have control of things. Because that control is contrary to Allah because we're supposed to render ourselves unto Allah and allow him to have dominion over our lives and to be selfless and to do what's right in Allah sight. But if we seek control, we're going to have a hard time humbling ourselves to the will of Allah because we seek our own. We seek our own will. And that in turn causes us to be partial it causes us to be a respecter of persons because we're seeking out our own desires and not conforming to the desires of Allah. Let's continue, Casa. You got anything? Just Sirach 29 and 20. Help thy neighbor according to thy power and beware that thou thyself fall not into the same. So be sure don't do something that's going to get you in a jam yourself. Okay. All right, chapter one, verse six of mandate two. He then that giveth is guiltless, for as he received from the Lord the ministration to perform it, he hath performed it in sincerity by making no distinction to whom to give or not to give. This ministration then, when sincerely performed, becomes glorious in the sight of Allah. He therefore that ministers thus sincerely shall live unto Allah. Therefore, keep this commandment, as I have told thee, that thine own repentance and that of thy household may be found to be sincere and thy heart be pure and undefiled. Amen. All right. So we want to operate in impartiality in all things that we may be able to conform to the perspective of Allah that our repentance may be sincere out of our house and our own repentance may be sincere, pure and undefiled. That means that we're truly seeking to do what's right. And we're truly seeking to turn from our ways to then conform unto the ways of Allah We have to truly put on the yoke of Yache not seeking to do our own will, but the will of him that sent us. And seeking his perspective of all things and his will of all things, the commandments of all things, that Allah may strengthen us to do it. You got anything, Kafi? I thought this was good. It really gives perspective for the focus to set our mind to one thing and being single-minded, knowing that it's desires that are contrary to the law, not being focused on the law at all times and in all scenarios, that leads us to a double mind or leads us to being taken away to the right hand or the left, you know, simplifies this journey. It's good. Praise Allah. All right. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section. Please subscribe to Hebrew readers, um, definitely hit the notification bell so that you can get any of the new videos that we, um, when we release them. Um, again, uh, check out the website at www.hebrewreaders.com um, or send us an email at hebrewreaders at gmail.com if you have any questions or comments. Um, we are always welcome to receive your questions and if you have any doctrinal questions or any uh, questions about the lessons please send us an email so that we can definitely give understanding
with all that, we glorify Allah Hayyam. We thank Ahaya, Yache, and the Holy Spirit Rock Kodoshi. And we hope Allah Hayyam keeps you all. Inshallah. HRC, 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 HRC,